So at this point, we are, everyone is through with voids now, <laughs> at least through with the lab part, I'm working on the lab section or on the uh, lab report part. So I will post, you can expect on Canvas today at some point, I'll post the, uh, the assignment associated with the lab two report. And it's gonna be essentially the same story as the lab one, just a PDF. I did get a request from a couple of groups who have, who, um, a couple of groups are taking videos of their projects, which is a wonderful idea, and wanted to submit some videos along with their lab reports. So in the description for the, for the assignment, I'll include a link to a box repository where if you would like to put a video, you can put it there. You don't have to do that. It's not a requirement for uh, lab submission, but if you're taking videos anyway and you wanna submit them, that's totally fine. The other thing I can post if there's interest with regard to the Boyd's lab is sort of an anonymized, uh, some anonymized statistics on number of Boyd's. If you wanna just see how things stack up. I will say that there was one decidedly outlier group, which if there's time today or maybe next week, we can talk about some of the, this was Jack, Raquel and Patrick found so many ways to cheat this algorithm cleverly and managed to get, well, what did it end up being, Jack? I'm just saying, Jack, because I'm looking at you right now. Was it like 450? Uh, yeah, 451. 451 voids. That's a lot. <laughs> so um, if, if there's time today, we'll just have a brief conversation about some of these tricks that they pulled, mostly exploiting uh, shortcomings of human perception to maintain an illusion while cheating some aspects of the algorithm. OK. Um, any pending Boyd's questions before I continue to talk about spectrogram stuff? I'm gonna talk mostly about the analog to digital converter today. Um, introduce the hardware peripheral and then we'll do the same sort of thing that we've been doing with this other stuff, which is talk at a high level about it for a little while and then look at some code and talk about implementing things. But um, if there are any pending questions about Boyd's or lab report questions, I can answer those before I get into the content. Can I just ask Jack, was your screen like at all visible or was the whole thing just filled and like kind of fuzzy looking? Uh, well, uh, Hunter took a pretty good video we could show maybe. Um, we, uh, we used uh, pixels, so it wasn't so bad, but okay. it, was, it was pretty cool. There was, there was a lot of them. Nice. Yeah. Um, we'll talk through some of the optimizations. The big one, Jack, and, and Raquel or, and uh, Patrick, if they're on the call as well. If I recall, you can correct me. It was noticing that every Boyd did not necessarily have to look at every other Boyd in order for the illusion to be maintained. So you would skip over, maybe look at every fifth or every 10th Boyd, which meant that it missed some, but experimentation showed that you couldn't tell. Is that right? Uh, exactly. Yeah, we um we yeah every, you know, the that one loop the the internal loop uh, we found was taking up a lot of time, um, but because it was just it was just accumulations, there wasn't much you could cut from it. Uh, but we simply ran it fewer times, so you'd sample uh, you'd you'd sample the swarm rather than looking at every single one, um, and this gave us yeah a huge gains on the uh, on the time, and we ended up sam I think the maximum sampling we found that worked was a, a sixtieth of the swarm. Um, was what we ended up with. So every Boyd only looked at one sixtieth of the other Boyds. Yeah. And despite that, the flocking still looked still looked good. Mm -hmm. um, the other interesting observation that you can correct me if I got wrong, but that I thought was was cool was there was a recommended. Um, so as a lot of you discovered, the visual range is really what dictated the amount of computation that took place per run. As you increase the visual range, the amount of neighboring voids increased. So the amount of computation increased. So the, the smaller you made your visual range, the, the more voids you could simulate at the same frame rate. Um, but we were enforcing you know, a particular visual range so that you couldn't just turn it down to zero and have birds just flying around and then it was easy. But what, the, what was noticed was you could turn down or I'm sorry, turn, yes, turn down the visual range. So each void was not looking as far, which meant less neighboring voids 
but if you had more voids and if they were only looking at a subset, then they actually were still passing close to one another, sort of in a statistic sense, so that the same effective visual range was maintained, at least by appearance, but you were doing less computation. Is that right? Yeah, yeah. The um, the sampling we found was what gave us the biggest gains, but there's a couple other things like that. Um, you know, it, we, we really noticed this when we were messing with the parameters and we suddenly got 10 milliseconds of extra wait time uh, when they scattered. Um, you know, occasionally they'd scatter on the corners and they'd be spread apart and we get so much more time. Um, so just by playing with that, we're able to, you know, get, get a couple more milliseconds every, every loop. Cool. Well, everyone did a really good job. I got to tell you, I, I can tell you now that the lab is over that I was a little worried about that lab <laughs> because it was the first time that we were running it and I thought, oh, I hope this isn't too hard. Um, but, but everyone did an excellent job. Uh, so, so really good job to everyone in the class. Um, okay. So why don't I talk now about the analog to digital converter. I'm going to share my screen. And the place I'm going to start this discussion is with um, share. Sorry, my computer's being there. Can you see that? Okay, not yet. Hopefully, in a moment. Yes. Okay. Uh, so the place I'm going to start this discussion is the place where I recommend you start working with the ADC, which is on the analog to digital converter webpage on the course site, which is down here in the PIC32 peripherals list. So let's look at the analog to digital converter. And the, the first thing I want to spend just some time looking at is this, this hardware diagram, which comes from the uh, reference manual. And this is showing you at a high level the various components that build up the analog to digital converter hardware peripheral system on the PIC32. So the first thing that I'll point out is what you're seeing at the top here is a large multiplexer that allows for you to select among a number of different analog inputs. So in this diagram, this suggests that you have, have 16 analog inputs, AN0 to AN15, on our particular chip, we have less than that. I think we have nine or 10. And those analog inputs are sort of distributed all over the various IO ports of the device. So in fact, let, let me just briefly jump over to the IO port page so that we can look at where these various analog inputs in. So you can see pins two to seven, two through seven have AN zero through AN five. And then if we look around here, we can see AN9 through AN11 on pins 24 to 26. So that's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine analog inputs on our particular device. Um, for this lab, I mentioned this last time, but I'll mention it again. For this lab, we are working specifically with analog input 11, AN11, which happens to be IO port RPB13 physical pin number 24. So the audio output of the lab PC is going into AN11 on your device. Uh, it is going into that particular pin because the demo code is set up for that pin. So it's a little bit merciful in some sense to not have you have to mess with those configurations necessarily. In any case, let's go back to the ADC page. So there's this multiplexer that allows for you to choose among these various analog inputs. Um, there is also here a channel scan mechanism that allows for you to, if you want, scan through a series of inputs sequentially and sample them all one after the other, boom, 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 store all the inputs and then read them all out. So there's a mechanism here for doing channel scanning if you want to. We're not going to have to do that in this lab. Maybe that's something, depending on what your final project is, that you'll want to mess with, is this channel scanning. Um, down here is where you set the reference voltage. And what you can see is, so this is the voltage, this is the voltage against which the analog input voltage is compared. 
right? So if you're measuring voltage, you need some reference to compare it against. This is where you set that reference. And what you can see, what's kind of interesting is you can set this to VREF low, which is essentially ground, so that you're measuring voltages relative to system ground. Or if you want, you can set the reference input to analog input AN1. And these two, your analog inputs and your reference voltage go into a difference amplifier. So this is a, a simple op amp circuit that's looking at the difference of these two voltages. So you can see that if this is set to ground, then you're measuring voltage relative to ground. If this is set to AN1, then you're measuring the difference between two voltages. It's a differential amplifier. Why might that be useful? We're not, if so for, for, our, for our lab, for our application, we're setting the reference voltage to ground. Why might it be useful to look at differences in voltages between two analog inputs? Can anyone think of a good application to that? Yeah, so in the audio world, um, audio signals are balanced and differential simply for a better noise rejection and interference rejection. So whenever you have long transmission lines, um, differential signals often work better. Yes, absolutely. No noise rejection is a good one. Um, another thing that you might consider doing with this is if you had some resistive device between those two analog inputs, you this differential voltage suddenly becomes a current measurement. So it provides for you it provides you with a mechanism for measuring current in addition to voltage if your application calls for something like that. Okay. So in any case, we, we multiplex in whichever analog channel we're going to be using. In this lab, it's gonna be AN11. We specify the reference voltage. In this lab, it's going to be ground. It could alternatively be analog input one. This goes into an op amp circuit and into this, uh, sample and hold circuitry. So what you can see here is a switch and a capacitor. When in your software, we're gonna look at the software in a moment and we'll see that there is a call to a PLIB function called something like ADC acquire. When you call that, the effect of calling that function is popping this switch open, which locks the voltage that was on this line on this capacitor. So it's a way to hold the voltage that was on this line for some amount of time on this capacitor. And then the voltage on this capacitor is, it, it enters into this uh, uh, sequential approximation hardware that converts the voltage on this capacitor to a 10 bit digital sample, which is then ultimately stored in the ADC buffer. So you can buffer a whole bunch of ADC measurements if you so desire and then read them out one at a time. The fact that this is how we're doing this sample and hold that we're using a capacitor here suggests that there is some upper limit to the speed with which you can read the analog to digital converter, right? And it's because there's a non-zero charge time for a capacitor. So there is some maximum speed with which you can read this ADC. Turns out that maximum speed is something like a megahertz, um, which is faster by the way than you can interrupt. So the only way to read the ADC at its maximum rate is to use direct memory access, to use DMA. So you would point a DMA channel at the ADC memory address and you would have it shuffle data from the ADC memory address to, mem to some other place in memory for you to use at a megahertz rate. Um, the, and, and like I said, the reason that you would have to do that with a DMA channel as opposed to an interrupt is you can't get in, in and out of it and interrupt at a megahertz, not on this device. Now for lab three, we're not sampling at a megahertz, right? We're going to be sampling at whatever rate is required in order to get the user specified frequency range on your spectrogram. So if the user wants to see as high as, frequencies as high as five kilohertz, then that means you need to sample at, at at least 10 kilohertz, right? So we're going to be sampling at in the tens of kilohertz range, which is perfectly, uh, which is a leisurely enough pace to do that sampling in software in an interrupt service routine. 
You could do this in DMA. You don't have to do this in DMA for lab three. You can do it in an interrupt service routine. And we'll look at some code that talks about how to do that. Any questions about this? By the way, this is a 10-bit ADC. How good is a 10-bit ADC? Is 10 bits good enough for a lot of applications? Why 10 bits? Anyone have guesses about this? So think about this. So 10 bits, that means, that means uh, um, 1,023-ish separate ADC possible values divided, so each of those values represents a voltage, of course, and the voltage range uh, that that represents is ground to, to VDD, which is 3.3 volts. So we're dividing 3.3 volts of range to 1,023 separate steps. That gives you something like, what? well, let's see, what's 3.3 divided by 1,023? So that's something like 3.2 millivolts per ADC unit. What do you think of that resolution? <laughs> do people have impressions of that resolution? So the thing to remember is that we, this ADC lives in a microcontroller and there's a lot of other circuitry and other current flowing around in this microcontroller that is going to introduce noise to analog measurements on this device. It is really, really difficult to make an analog measurement on a microcontroller like this that for which that bottom 10th bit isn't just noise. If you, have, if you have something like an SPI channel just physically near your analog lines, it doesn't have to be touching it, just has to be physically near it so that there's voltages changing near the analog lines. That's going to induce noise on your analog pins, which makes it very hard to get measurements with resolution much greater than 10 bits. So it's sort of what's the point? You know, what's the point of having an ADC with more than 10-ish bits if the noise environment is such that that's all that's going to be really possible? So you know, that's why it's about that number. Which, by the way, and just to, this is sort of an aside, but that's one of the things that I find so interesting about debugging electrical systems is the environment in which the debugging take pl takes place for electrical engineering is the physical world, which means when you're debugging, you care about things like physics. <laughs> you care about like if you're make if you're debugging an analog system, you care about the fact that there's voltages changing in physical proximity to your system because of the physics involved. It's creating magnetic it, creating magnetic fields, which is inducing currents, which is inducing voltages. All of that matters, right? So the environment in which you're debugging is the physical universe and you care about the laws which govern that universe in your debugging process, which is, can make debugging hard, but also makes it an interesting way to learn about the world, I think, I think. Okay, any, any let me see if there's anything I've missed here in this list. Um, so I'm gonna look next at the reference manual. I wanna just point out a few things in the reference manual for the ADC, and then we'll look at some code there are a lot of degrees of freedom with this peripheral, right? There's a lot of configuration that you can make, which means, which, which just means that getting it configured properly in code, there's a lot of configuration parameters. So I wanna just take some time to talk through a few of those parameters. Uh, let me just see if there's anything I missed here that I wanna mention before I move on. Oh. I don't think so. I don't think so. I think, I think let's look at the code at this point. So let me take a look at the, the homework for this lab, which I hope you are continuing to look at <laughs> the homework and the reading for this lab. Uh, so let's look at the ADC reference manual. And what I want to bring your attention to mostly is, um, so here's the same picture we were just looking at. 
What I want to take a look at are the control registers associated with the ADC, because as we've talked about what, what PLIB, the, uh, the C library that configures and controls the hardware peripherals, what PLIB is actually doing is manipulating control and status registers associated with each of these peripherals. So if you were to look under the hood of PLIB and see what it's actually doing, you're going to see it's going in and touching a lot of the registers that we're going to look at. So I want to look at those registers in brief now and just get a sense of the sorts of configurations that they manage so that when we look at the software in PLIB, it's like a little bit familiar. In any case, so let's look at this. So these are all of the control registers associated with the ADC, three control registers, an input select register, port configuration register, input scan select register. Um, and I wanna just look at some of these configurations. So let's look at ADC control register one and just glance through some of the configurations that the bits in this register represent. So uh, the whole top half of this register is unimplemented. Okay, bit 15 uh, turns the ADC module on. Um, bit 13, stop in idle mode. I wanna, I wanna talk a little bit about bits 10 to eight which is the out data output format bits. So as I mentioned, this is a 10 bit ADC, which means the output of this ADC is 10 bits of information. What this particular configuration allows for you to specify is what data type do you want for those 10 bits to be placed into when you read the ADC? And you have a bunch of different options. So for example, perhaps the the simplest option is to have it placed in a 16-bit integer, which is to say, you know, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten 10 bits of information padded with a bunch of zeros for an unsigned integer output. That, that is perhaps the most straightforward option. You have other options. You could, for example, specify that you want the output placed into a signed integer data type. Why would you want a signed integer out of your analog to digital converter? I thought ADC is read in the range of ground to uh, VDD, in our case, 3.3 volts. Why does it make sense to have a signed output? Well, uh, for a differential reading of, uh, first of all, if you're reading two lines, you're gonna want positive and negative. That's exactly right. That's exactly right, yeah. So depending on your application, if you're using that differential amplifier to look at differences between two analog inputs, you want to be able to represent negative voltages as compared to your reference. So there's a signed integer option here. Um, and there are a few other options. There's this, these, these fractional options, which put the data into some sort of fixed point that I don't frankly fully understand at this point. <laughs> I haven't messed with this option very much. Um, in our in our application, we're going to be. I recommend using integer sixteen output, and then what we're actually going to do in our software is shove that into a fixed point data type and treat it as a fixed point. But we're shoving that data into the bottom ten bits of. Uh, we'll, you all will likely use an acume data type, um, and then we'll do the math in fixed point. Okay. Interestingly, the fractional 16 bit is very close, but not quite an acume. It's one bit off. Therefore, you may as well just read it as an integer and do the shift. Okay. Uh, any other things I want to call our attention to? So. There's various uh, special functions, offset calibration, um, scan input selection. You can check the buffer fill status. As, as we saw, the ADC fills up a buffer. You can check the status of that buffer by reading a particular bit. Um, lots of degrees of freedom. Anything else interesting? Let me just glance through here. <laughs> 
you select the, this is where we select the negative input, the reference voltage. We can select that either as analog input one by making this particular bit one, or we set it as V reference low by making it zero. As usual, PLib is going to make all of this much more readable for us, but I'm pointing to you to this part of the data sheet and to these particular registers as the ones that PLib in for this hardware peripheral is, is manipulating. But okay, let's take a look at, unless there are questions about this, I, I say we take some look, take a look at some code at this point. So, so as I mentioned, the, the example code for this lab is a little bit more distributed than in previous labs. This is intentional, okay? So I wanna, we'll start by looking at the example code that for which, that I recommend you use for setting up, what am I trying to say? We'll look at the example code that I recommend you use to figure out how to set up and read the ADC in software. And the place to go find that example code is on the analog to digital uh, page example example one here. This example code, which let me just copy into uh, Sublime for some readability. So okay. So um, all that this example code does is is instantiate two threads. One's a timer thread that is sort of the heartbeat, just printing out a timer value. And then the other one is reading the ADC in software. In this case, we're reading the ADC in a thread. In your lab, you will be reading the ADC in an interrupt service routine, but the code's gonna look very similar. I wanna start, however, by taking a look at the configuration for the analog to digital converter in main, which is, ah, which is this chunk of code here. And I wanna just walk through some of these parameters. So we start our configurations in line 144 here by closing ADC 10, the 10 there indicating a 10 bit ADC. So we'll close ADC 10. And then we define a series of parameters that we will later, later use when we call the open ADC 10 uh, PLIB function. We'll call it with these parameters to configure the ADC, but we configure each of these parameters separately. So we can just take a look at each of these. In parameter one, we specify the, for, the data type that we want out of the ADC. In this case, we're saying, give us uh, an int 16, right? So we just saw this in the reference manual. This is just specifying that we want an unsigned int and we want the data in the bottom 10 bits of that int. ADC clock auto just means that the, the clock associated with the ADC is going to be always running. And then ADC auto sampling off means that we in software will specify when we want to acquire a new ADC sample. If this were configured to ADC auto sampling on, then as soon as one ADC sample was finished, the hardware peripheral would automatically start gathering the next one. So it would be ga automatically gathering ADC samples as quickly as it could and filling up that buffer. In our application, we don't wanna do that. Um, we're going to gather ADCs precisely when we tell it together. We're gonna to gather samples precisely when we want to as specified in our code. Okay, so this is parameter one. And in a moment, we can look at the, uh, the header file to see what our other options would have been here. Parameter two, we are setting the references here for the ADC. So we're saying we want the voltage reference to go from VDD to VSS, which is to say 3.3 volts down to ground turning off some special functions. So we're turning off offset calibrate, turning off auto scan, uh, sending samples per, per interrupt to one, turning off alternate, uh, alternate, alternate buffer and turning off um, alternate input, turning off a bunch of special functions. Oops, and, uh, and setting the voltage range. 
Uh, real quick, Hunter, just so I like understand this correctly, could you still have like the ADC auto sample? It's just that it would be doing like a bunch of useless work since we're not actually reading it like that often. So is the question, could you have it, could you have the ADC always sampling and filling up the buffer and then you just decide when you're gonna go read that buffer? Yeah. I think you could. Yeah. It does work. Okay, yeah. So I, yeah, I just wanted to see if I understood that correctly, but there's no reason to like make it do useless work, right? <laughs> yes. Now the, it is a hardware peripheral though. So the useless work that it's doing is sort of, you aren't sacrificing any software cycles for your own program on the CPU by having it do that work. It's something separate that's doing work, but. Right, I guess from like an energy standpoint, if you were like having a standalone system, you would want to turn that off. I think probably yes, yeah, yeah. Um, parameter three here sets the, the timing for the ADC. And I will be honest with you, the documentation for this particular parameter is obscure. <laughs> and I haven't understood it well enough to really be able to explain to you what's going on here. Maybe Bruce can, um, it, it's pretty well, obscure. It is more than pretty obscure. The, the only way I could figure out that how to calibrate this originally was to try it a hundred times with different sets of, of parameters. So you read some, you try and experiment, you read some more, you try and experiment. And these parameters work with the particular peripheral bus frequency we're using. Mess with them at your own risk. I would say, turn your back on them. Don't mess with them. The, if you want completely high performance, if you really cared about going to 900 kilohertz, you would have to care about this. You don't care about that. Um, by the way, the FFT demo code, which I saw some of you working out with in the last lab, defaults to 500 kilohertz sample rate, which is at least two orders of magnitude too high for you to see any useful information on a spectrogram. So you have to change the sample rate at least. And the other thing that you'll have to change about that example code, well, you don't have to, but I think the path of least resistance for you in this lab is to, in that example code, the ADC is being sampled through DMA and you can change the setup to match what's in this example code so that you are instead sampling the ADC in software in an interrupt service routine. That example code is an example of how to use the FFT, uh, the provided FFT function. So use that example code as, as an example of how to utilize that as an input output system. Use this example code that we're looking at now as your starting point for setting up and reading the ADC. Okay. Um, parameter four we specify the, the analog input that we want. In our case, it's gonna be AN11, which as we saw on the IO page is RPB13, which is pin 20 something. Um, this, this is true for your lab as well. We're going to be using analog input 11. And then parameter five, we say skip scan all. If we wanted to scan through a series of analog inputs, we would specify the analog inputs that we wanted to scan through in this uh, parameter here. As a slight aside, if you decided to scan several inputs, then you would have to put the auto sampling mode on. Here. We then set the ADC channel. So this first parameter is saying ADC channel zero, that's MUX, MUX input zero. We're in that, in that hardware diagram we looked at, you saw you could multiplex in a whole bunch of ADC channels. 
ADC channel zero, um, uh, negative voltage reference to sample A. And then this input here is, uh, I'm sorry, so this is setting the, the, the voltage reference to VREF low. And this is setting the, um, the voltage that is being compared against that reference to positive input AN11, as far as I understand. Okay. And then we open the ADC using all of these parameters. So we put all these parameters together and open the ADC. By the way, if you wanted to read a different ADC channel, you would not have to close and do all this reconfiguration. You can do that by setting the channel with the set channel ADC 10 PLIB function call. In lab three, you won't have to do that. In your final projects, maybe you will, depending what you're doing, okay? So we set the channel open the ADC using all of our configurations here, and then enable ADC 10. And now we're set up to read samples and we're set up to read samples in software. So we can look next at how that's done. Uh, in this example code, that's done in a thread. In your code, this will be done in an interrupt service routine. But there's, there's, this involves two lines. Um, one of these lines is acquire ADC 10, which you will recall from the hardware diagram, the effect of this is the popping open of that switch, which locks the voltage that was on that line on the capacitor to then be successively approximated into a digital sample and stored in the ADC buffer. When you call acquire ADC 10, you pop that switch open and start that process which takes non-zero time. It takes, it takes a finite amount of time for that whole process to occur. So the reason for calling this acquire ADC 10 after the other line of code associated with this process, which is read ADC 10, and then this zero means the zeroth item in the ADC buffer. So we're reading the zeroth ADC buffer item. Uh, and storing it in a variable called ADC9. In this case, we're storing it in an int called ADC9. Why are we doing the re? Why are we doing the acquire after the read? Well, this takes non-zero time. So what we, we would like is by the time we execute all of this and get back to reading the ADC again, we would like for that value to be ready for us to read in the buffer. We don't want to have to sit there and wait, right? So we read the ADC and then we instantly start the process for acquiring the next sample so that when our code gets back to this line, it's there ready for us. And we're not sitting and waiting for no reason, right? We're sort of folding this in some sense. Does that make sense? So in your code, you wanna be doing fixed point arithmetic with your ADC samples. So in this example, we are storing the ADC value in an int called ADC9. You will want to do some sort of a conversion from int to fix. As you'll recall from our discussion of fixed point is a fast conversion, it's just a shift, right? So you'll do a quick shift from int to fix, and then you will store your ADC sample in some array where you're accumulating 512 samples. Once you've filled up that array, you will stop manipulating that array. Signal to a thread that it's ready to be manipulated. That thread will copy the contents of the array into a different array, which will be passed into the FFT function. And the thread will signal back to the interrupt service routine by some mechanism that's up to you. It will signal back to the interrupt service routine Hey, I'm done with that array. You can start filling up the next batch. Okay. Is it possible, incidentally, suppose, suppose that we just declared this, this variable that in this example code is an int, ADC9. What if we just declared this as an acume and shoved the value of read ADC 10 into that acume without doing a conversion. Would that be okay? 
experimentation shows yes, that's fine. And the reason for that is you are, you are then working in, what you've really done is changed units. And as long as you're consistent with your units, everything works out fine. So you don't necessarily have to do, as, as my, my experimentation shows, you don't necessarily have to do this conversion from int to fix. You can just declare this variable where you're going to store ADC values as a fixed point and a queue, shove those 10 bits into that queue. So it's going to be, you know, some number that's, that is interpreted as less than one. Who cares, right? It's, it's as long, it doesn't matter. You pass those values into the FFT function and do your calculations using those units and that's fine. Questions about this? Okay, so your code in lab three, your code in lab three will have, will have identical configurations of the ADC as is shown here. And in lab three, you will read the ADC as shown here. You will not be reading it in a thread. You will be reading it in an interrupt service routine. That's a recommendation. If you want, if you want to do all of this with DMA, you may do that. Uh, I am just, I am just cautioning you about a can of worms that you might be opening. Okay, which maybe you want to save for a final project when you have a few more weeks. That's all I'm saying. Okay. Do you need Unless a there, sorry, go ahead, Kat. Oh, just, sorry. Just do you need four separate parameters? Is there any reason why you can't just have all of that packed up into one line? Are they organized in any particular way? These, these parameters here? Yeah. If we took a look at, actually, let's do that. Um, the, the open ADC 10 function expects four arguments. Okay. So these parameters are each of those arguments where each argument is a bunch of uh, masked conditions. Okay. You could put it all on one line. You could put it all on the open ADC line and the line would be then uh, 150 characters long. Okay. And I know that offends the sensibilities of the 80 character limit people in the lab. <laughs> Thank you. Other questions? Okay. I want to then look at the other piece of example code for this lab, which is the one that it, it shows how to use the, um, the FFT function. So let me just open up the lab. And take a look at this example code. Let me copy this into Sublime. Um, and I want to point out a few things just to be careful about. Okay. So a few things just to be careful about. The first one I already mentioned, which is that in this example code, the ADC is being read by DMA. You don't have to do that in your, in, in your lab three. You can set it up to read in software. As Bruce mentioned, when you fire up this example and start playing with it, remember that the ADC is configured in this example to, to gather samples at 500 kilohertz, which means when you talk into the PIC, you are not going to see anything unless you change that sample rate. If you want to change the sample rate, you can do so down here in main. You can change the sample rate from 500 kilohertz to something more reasonable, say 5,000 hertz. Okay, you'll remember that your voice is somewhere in the hundreds of hertz up to maybe maybe a couple of kilohertz range, right? So if you sample at 5,000 hertz, you're going to be able to see frequencies up to 2,500 hertz. That's about right. Okay. So you can change that here and you'll be able to see your FFT bouncing. The FFT that is used in this file uses a fixed point data type that is defined in this file called fix 14. You don't have to use fix 14. And in the lab write up, I've included a, a version of this function that uses accumes instead. So if you wanna just use the built-in uh, standard fix accume data type, 
there's an, a version of this function that exists in the lab in the lab write-up that does that. Um, I've gotten some questions about what are these begins and ends. <laughs> if you look, this is simpler than you realize. If you look up at the top of this function, we will find pound defines for begin and end somewhere up here, and we'll see that they are just open curly brace. Yeah, open curly brace and close curly brace. So you can replace every begin with open curly brace, replace every end with closed curly brace. Um, I stop, I used to do that because I find it hard to tell a curly brace from a round brace, but the students hate it. <laughs> and so I stopped doing it. I was accused of being a uh, Pascal bigot, but um, so I just stopped doing it. But this is a fairly old chunk of code. So in any case, just that's, that's all that that is. Um, you will recall that what this function does is take two arrays as inputs. The, each of these arrays in your example will be 512 elements long. And they will, each element of that array will be, for the real input, it will be a sample from the ADC. And for the imaginary input, it will be an array of zeros. And this third argument is the length of the array as a power of two which for you will be nine, because two to the ninth is 512. You pass these into the FFT function. It computes the FFT and stores the output in the same arrays that you passed into it. So there's, there's a real and imaginary input to the FFT and there's a real and imaginary output from the FFT. And the real and imaginary outputs are stored in, in the same arrays that you've passed in. What this code then does, if I can find where it does it, what this code then does is, is draw the FFT on the TFT display. So that is to say the x-axis is frequency, the y-axis is, is magnitude of the complex number output from the FFT. So it uses the alpha max beta min algorithm to compute the magnitude of each complex output and plots that, plots that as an amplitude. Remember that for the spectrogram, the, the magnitude of the output maps to a color of a pixel and not a position on the TFT display. I've seen a little bit of confusion about this in a few groups. So just keep that in mind. In the, in the spectrogram, the FFT gets compressed to one row of pixels. So your, your, if you're scanning across in this dimension, your X coordinate depends on which, which batch of samples this is. And then your Y coordinate becomes your index in the array, which maps to frequency and the color of that pixel is related to the magnitude of the FFT output. So there's some manipulation involved here. There was also that, that particular code had a weird approximation to the log of the power. So I could do a log plot. So after the min max, the alpha min, alpha max beta min algorithm is applied, the next few lines of code takes a four bit approximation to a log. Don't bother. Because you get to choose the color map. And there's a recommended color map in the lab write up. You can play with it and make it pretty. However, you know, I, I, I chose some colors that I thought looked nice, but if you have different tastes and you want to play with those colors, by all means, uh, you may do so. Any questions?